When I walked in this morning, uh, they were rehearsing that song, Holy Forever. And I thought to myself, I can't wait to sing that with all God's people. And it was as good as I anticipated, just to sing together and give him praise and be reminded. As we lift our voices, doesn't that happen to your heart? God reminds you, oh, that's who he is. And so it's good to give him praise. A couple of things to make you aware of. You've heard it. You've got the magnets. You've seen the signs. You've been seen on social media. We've been talking about it. But this is the last two-service Sunday. So enjoy it, because next week, on the 15th, we begin three services here at Kessler Campus. Now, I know most of you are thinking, what's most convenient for me? Probably 9.30. Here's my greatest fear. Not my greatest fear, but one of them. That all of the, a thousand of you will come at 9.30, and we'll have like 10 people at, at 8 uh, and, uh, and at 11. So if at all possible, to, for the sake of our kids downstairs and to make room for our guests, would you choose an hour that's maybe a little less convenient? If you're a regular attender, if you consider this your spiritual home and your family and you're on mission here, consider, please, coming at 8 or 11, which will help us make space for our guests and we don't overcrowd our kids' ministries downstairs. Speaking of our kids' ministries, we need your help. Many of you have stepped up and said yes to serving. That's, we thank you. That's making a huge difference. Two critical needs are Masterpiece Ministry, caring for families with kids with special needs and disabilities, and our uh, nursery area as well. Uh, so if you're interested and able, would you consider uh, signing up to serve in one of those areas? We need your help to make this all work, and we're grateful for those of you who have already said yes to that. Last, I just want to say, we talk about this frequently, but if you're a regular attendant, if you're a guest, we don't you feel pressure to give money at all, but those of you that are a regular part of Chapel Street and you give consistently to the mission of God here, I just want you to hear me say thank you. It's making a difference in ways that we... We get excited to tell you about. So thank you for your ongoing generosity because we serve a generous God. Everything we have comes from his gracious hand. Let's pray together once more. Father, you are indeed holy. And we are not. And our world struggles with this. And it's difficult sometimes for us to look out at what's happening in the world. In Ukraine and in Israel and right next door in Chicago. And uh, be fearful full of or just frustration. And, and then we're reminded that all things hold together by a word of your power, that you are on the throne, that despite how it might look to us in a moment, you are, in, you are reigning and you are holy, and we are your people. So speak to us because we need to hear from you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we kicked off a series on the book of James, the letter of James, uh, I'm very excited about this. Pastor Brian kicked off this, this series. Uh, it's one of the most unique uh, and, and challenging and exciting letters in the New Testament. I know I say this at the beginning of every sermon series, I get excited about this, but I really am. Uh, how many of you have read James before? I feel, yeah, look at that. Because it's practical and it's like you feel like it's easy to understand. Uh, there's a lot in it for us. James, as we learned last week, James, the leader of the first church in Jerusalem. The church is born in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost and it grows in Jerusalem and in that area. And the key leader of the first church is James, the author of this epistle. Also James, the brother of Jesus. There's a couple of Jameses that we could maybe think this is. James, son of Alphaeus. James, the uh, brother of, of uh, John. But no, this is James, the brother of Jesus, the leader of the first church in Jerusalem. Now, I don't know about you, but if you were going to write your resume to people that you want them to listen to what you had to say, I would think leader of the first church and brother of Jesus would like be at the top of the list, right? You'd want to include those things. Like, I led the first church, and oh yeah, Jesus, he's my bro. No, 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 I mean actually my brother. We grew up together. That would be something that would give you credibility. Um, but I think it's beautiful uh, that that's not how James introduces himself. You, know, you might remember from last week that James and his brothers, Jesus had brothers and sisters, that his family members did not initially believe in him. They thought he was, you know, you know my brother always thinks he's God kind of thing. And then, and then we, we read in Mark three twenty one, they actually tried to stop him. They thought he was out of his mind. And now James becomes the leader of the church in, Israel, in, in Jerusalem. What happened? He met the resurrected Jesus. It changed everything. Look at how James introduces himself one more time, just to, just to do a little review here. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, the 12 tribes dispersed abroad. And then chapter 2, verse 1. My brothers and sisters, do not show favoritism as you hold on to the faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. How does James see himself? Not the, not the leader of the church, not the brother of Jesus, but servant. That's the Greek word doulos. It literally means slave. That's how he identifies himself. 
How does James see Jesus? Lord, Kyrios, reigning Lord over my life, over all the world, Lord of glory, the glorious Lord. I think it's worth asking the question before we go any further, how do you see yourself? How do you identify yourself? James, for all that he could have written down, he says, my primary identity is I belong to him. I'm just here to serve him. Good friend of mine named Pastor Dan uh, Rack, a pastor of a church in St. Charles, said to me one time, we're having tacos and talking about life and ministry, and he said, Jeff, I'm just loose change in the pocket of God. And it's a privilege to be in there. And he can spend me however he wants. Uh, What a statement. That's James. I'm just a servant. He's everything. Last week we saw James describing how faith works in the midst of trials and temptations. Our series is called Faith Works. That a faith in Christ ought to work itself out and have something to do with every aspect of our life. And that's really what James' letter is about. Last week we looked at how does faith work in the midst of difficult situations and temptations. This week we look at how faith works in relation to the word of God. How does faith work in relation to God's word the word. Let's look at verses 19 through 27 of chapter 1. My dear brothers and sisters, understand this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Therefore, ridding yourselves of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, humbly receive the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like someone looking at his own face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer who works, this person will be blessed in what he does. If anyone thinks he is religious without controlling his tongue, his religion is useless and he deceives himself. Pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to look after, look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Okay, three postures uh, as it relates to the word of God and our faith that we'll talk through. I'll just list them for you. If you're a note taker, you'll get them all down that we'll have them and we'll go through them. We should be quick to hear God's word, humble to receive God's word, and faithful to obey God's word. Quick to hear, humble to receive, and faithful to obey. First, quick to hear God's word. The basic posture James is describing here is a person who's eager, who's willing, who's ready to hear from God. Uh, Last night at our Saturday night service, uh, Pastor Joe Scavato said something at the outset of the service. He said, sometimes we come to worship and we're not ready to worship. Anybody relate to that? We just, it's all we can do to get here. (laughs) We got other things going on, other stresses of life, other fears, other angsts, issues. We're just not ready. That's okay, at least you got here. But hopefully in the course of worship, God speaks to our hearts. I don't know what it's like for you when you come to the word of God privately in your own devotions, corporately when you're, if you're in a small group Bible study, which I hope you are, or in the large group gathering right now. Do you come eager, ready to hear from God? If I'm, on, if I'm honest, in my life, I'm far more eager to speak than I am to hear. Are you? I got something to say. And you all are going to listen. I don't know. I mean, I, I have things I want to communicate. Ask my children about this, right? Am I first, do I first seek to hear, to listen, to understand before I seek to be understood? I've got opinions. Nowhere is this more prevalent or needed than on social media. It's almost like James wrote this for our Twitterverse or Xverse, whatever it is now, right? Like he's got something, he's, it, it's speaking to us about practical wisdom. Be quick to listen. Slow to speak or to reply or to post (laughs) and slow to anger. He's writing for our 21st century moment. Look at verses 19 and 20 one more time. My brothers and sisters, understand this. Understand what? Everyone, all of us, if we're serious about living in faith, be quick to listen to one another, but ultimately to God. Slow to speak and slow to anger. Notice notice the progression there. If we are quick to listen to the other person and ultimately to the word of God, and and if we are slow to speak, if you stop yourself before you fire off that reply or blast out your your opinion, 
you will be slow to anger. There's just very practical wisdom here. And then he says, for the anger, human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Here he means righteousness in, in relationship. The righteousness of God in human relationships. Human anger will never produce right relationships. He doesn't say never be angry. There are times when Jesus got angry. There are times when as his followers, we should have righteous indignation at injustice in the world. Caring about what God cares about. And I would like to convince myself that most of the time when I'm angry, it's righteous anger. But it's not. Most of the time it's selfish. It's about me. I'm irritated. This is costing me something. I don't want to deal with this. Maybe that's just me. And I think it's very practical here what he's saying to us. Now you might be thinking, well, I'm not really an angry person. That's not my issue. And maybe so. Maybe you should ask somebody near you if that's true or not. <laughs> Those that are angry really think they're angry. But even if that's not your deal, we live in a culture that is increasingly angry. You've probably heard the phrase outrage culture. It's happening all around us. In fact, NPR did a study uh, recently uh, in 2021, uh, the, the Watson uh, Health Poll of all metrics. And here's what 84% of Americans said about our generation. Are we angrier than a generation ago? 84% said yes. By any measure, yes. More angst, more anxiety, more fearfulness, and more anger expressed in our culture than a generation ago. We're angry about inflation. We're angry about the economy. We're angry about the coming election. We're angry about gun policies and abortion policies and LGBTQ issues and racial injustice and immigration and border policies and the war in Ukraine and the war in Israel that's just happened. There's so many things, right, that we get frustrated and angry about. And that's just out there, not to mention in here. And it doesn't really seem to matter what side of whatever issue you're on. Everybody's angry. Here's a question. Why do we keep watching and listening to the stuff that makes us angry? Do you ever, you ever notice that? We watch stuff and it, it frustrates you and you think, I'm going to, but you don't turn it off. You don't go listen to, you don't go read the word of God or listen to worship music or go for a walk. You're like, I'm going to click, 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 right? Like, why do we do that? Researchers at the University of California, Berkeley, on the Social Interaction Lab did a study. Of, they did brain scans on human beings expressing anger, and they found that the brain activity of those expressing anger or frustration was remarkably similar to human beings experiencing pleasure. That's interesting, isn't it? That the brain activity, when you're expressing anger, is similar to when you're experiencing something good. Why? Because in the moment, it feels good. It feels good in the moment to give vent to your anger. And we deceive ourselves thinking, I'm doing something about it. I will post this on Facebook, and that will change the world, right? There, right? Or I'm going to reply to this, or I'm going to fire this off, and I feel in the moment as if I'm taking control. But it's a lie, because you know this. The reality is, when you feel like you're somehow taking control by venting at your anger, you're not. You're losing control, actually. This is why James says, human anger will never bring about the righteousness of God, despite how it feels in the moment. We'll never get there that way. In fact, James often sounds like the book of Proverbs. It's like the New Testament book of wisdom. A couple of Proverbs that speak to this very thing James is saying. If one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. St. Francis of Assisi famously said in his prayer for peace, seek to understand before you seek to be understood. Do you see a man who is hasty in his words? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Slow to speak, quick to listen, and slow to anger. It is such good practical wisdom for us. In fact, just for a minute, I want you to think about this. The next time you're frustrated with someone in your life or something, and you want to give vent to that frustration, just practice what James is saying. Stop. Stop. Don't reply. Don't fire off the email. Don't say it. Listen for the voice of God. Pray, slow down, and see what that does, just in the practical interactions you have in the world. So let's be quick to hear from God. Second, be humble to receive God's word. Humble to receive God's word. I think this is the crucial link between being hearers and being doers of the word. 
what James is saying to us, and it's easy to miss. Look at verse 21. Therefore, ridding yourselves of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and that, that sounds like moral filth and evil that is so prevalent. He's talking about in our interactions, the way we treat each other. Humbly receive. Humbly receive the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Let's talk about what he means here. Humbly receiving the implanted word. The word here in verse 21 is the same as the word in verse 18. You'll see that here in verse 18. By his own choice, he gave us birth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. We can go back one slide to verse uh, 21. So verse 18, the word of truth, verse 21, the implanted word able to save your soul. The word of God, and by the way, it's not referring to the whole Bible. They didn't have that yet. It's speaking about the teaching of Jesus, the Jesus, the, the center of the gospel, the story of the teaching, life, death, resurrection of Jesus, and what that, what that meant. That's the implanted word, the word of truth, able to save your soul and give you life. The word of God changes you, makes you new, forgives your sin, saves you. And transforms you. Now all of James talk about doing the word, being doers and obedience, and he's got a lot to say about this. It's flowing from this central reality. It starts when the word becomes implanted in your soul. For example, I prayed the prayer to receive Jesus when I was a little boy in vacation Bible school. I don't remember exactly how old I was. My mom's here, she could probably tell you. But honestly, nothing changed really. I mean, I know how to say the Christian stuff. Because I grew up in a Christian family, went to church. But nothing about me really changed until I was 17. 17 years old, Jim Condill was a, a teacher and a coach at Chris Lake Central High School and the sponsor of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes reached out to me, prayed for me, invested in me, shared the gospel with me, and with him I prayed. And the word was implanted. I look back and I think, yeah, I knew about God and I, and I believed generally in God, but I was not transformed. I was not made new. I didn't have new life until that moment. It changed me. So you can come to church, you can know how to say the stuff, you can know a few Bible verses, but have you humbly received the word of God, the gospel? The received word receive is the Greek word dekomai. It means to uh, welcome gladly. Jesus uses this in Luke 8, verse 13. He says, those on the rock are those who when they hear the word, they receive it with joy. God loves me? There's a God who knows my name, who made me in his image, who sent his son to die for me, to forgive my sin, to do for me what I can't possibly do for myself? Of course I want to receive that. Fall on your knees and cry out to God. Here's what Charles Spurgeon writes about this idea of receiving. By the way, just a sweet head of hair and beard. Known as the Prince of Pre Preachers. That word receive is a very instructive gospel word. It is the door through which God's grace enters to us. We are not saved by working, but by receiving. Not by what we give to God, but by what God gives to us and we receive from him. James sometimes is criticized for, for saying too much about works as if we can earn our salvation. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, but when you have received this implanted word which saves you, then God invites you into a life that he has something for you to do, a way for you to live. It's the door by which we receive the grace of God. Every one of us needs to return again and again to this posture of humbly receiving the implanted word. We drift to the thinking we can do it ourselves or picking and choosing what from God's word we want to listen to. But right now, some of you are here and maybe you've been around the church for a while or Christian stuff, but you have never done this. You've never really humbly received what God wants to give you through his son, Jesus. You could do that now. You don't need a special ceremony. You don't need like a special pastoral prayer. You don't need a sky writing and, you know, or lights from heaven. Right now in your heart, you can humbly receive the grace of Jesus Christ. Have the word implanted in you that begins to change you. God is doing that all the time in people's lives.
And it's possible some of you have been coming here, and, and I, this is, I, I know this happens. And you, you, I know these people, they seem normal. He seems not too weird up there. This isn't my kind of church. These are normal people. And you come and you like the energy of the place. But, you've, but God doesn't have like followers by proximity, right? Or grandchildren. He only has children, those who humbly receive. Maybe that's your day today. Say, Lord, I, I want to receive the gospel of grace. I, I know that I can't handle my life on my own. I want to receive what you're offering me. And when that happens, you begin to see Jesus, as James said, as Lord of glory. And you're just here, happy to be part of his family. So, quick to hear from God, humble to receive God's word. Third, faithful to obey God's word. Faithful to obey. Now, James has a lot to say about what it means to be doers of the word. He'll talk about that repeatedly. Uh, We'll see that many of the things that are in this passage, he's teeing up for the rest of the book. But his starting point, and ours, is always this humility of receiving what God wants to give us through Christ. Let's look again at verses 22 through 25. And and this time I want you to see them in the English Standard Version because of the way uh, this translation puts them. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. This is an interesting phrase. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who intently looks at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, these two phrases, the perfect law and the law of liberty. And perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If all you do is listen to sermons, by the way, the average uh, churchgoer in America, Chapel Street's not an exception to this, comes to church less than two times a month. I don't know what you think about your last couple months. Attendance patterns. And I'm not, I mean, obviously I want you all here all the time. But the point, I know life is life and we have things going on. But if all you do is come to church every other week and hear a sermon, or maybe you get a little bit of Bible on your Bible app now and then, but it doesn't translate into any, real no changes in your life at all. I had a, a man who was getting, the, I was going to know him, he's in our church. And I said, tell me about your upbringing in terms of your faith. So I grew up in a family that went to church, but we were never terribly inconvenienced by anything that was ever said there. <laughs> That's a great statement. We went to church, but it didn't matter. We didn't do anything about it. It was just something we did. Now, I don't know if that's because the church he went to never said anything, never challenged anybody from the word, or if it's because he just wasn't paying attention and didn't care. But either way, his point was, nothing really changed. If, if all you do is hear a sermon now and then, or read a verse now and then, and, and it doesn't make a difference in how you live, you are, according to God's word, deceiving yourself. You're lying to yourself. You're kidding yourself if you think that's okay and that's enough. And more than that, you're cheating yourself out of the blessing. You're missing out, is what he says. A couple of weeks ago at our first Doubter's Guide to Jesus event, and by the way, there's one more of these next Saturday night. I encourage you to attend. Uh, Dr. John Dixon has done a fantastic job. We wrap up the series. You can watch them all online and come and see the last one. But he made this comment at the first one, Jesus the teacher. He said, 20% of the gospel accounts of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, deal with only the last three days of his life. Betrayal, arrest, death, and resurrection. And we want to focus on that. And there's a lot, that's pretty important. But 80% of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John deal with the rest of his life. Namely, his teaching. Sometimes we think we can have Jesus as our Savior, but not as our teacher and our Lord. Those go together, right? If he's your Savior, then he's going to be your teacher. And you can't call him your teacher if you're not going to do what he says. He's not teacher like, you know, like, you're, like a professor, like when I was in seminary, I didn't think, well, I must do everything my professor says, right? I mean, I listened, and we approached Jesus like this. Interesting, Jesus. I'll take that under advisement. I'll put that in my notebook and put it away and never look at it again, right? Or I'll decide if that's valuable for me. No. If he's Savior and Lord and teacher, then 
Why would you not? If, if he is the implanted word that forgives your sin and saves your soul and sets you free, what sense does it make to not do what he says? This is what James means by this looking in the mirror thing. Why do you look in the mirror? Why would you look in the mirror? How many of you get up in the morning and look in the mirror because I want to say, looking good. Yeah. Some men are like this. Most women, not so much. Right? You look in the mirror to get what? An accurate reflection of who you are. I, do you have certain mirrors in your house that make you look better than others? I do. <laughs> There's some, I like that when I look in this mirror. Right? Other mirrors, I'm like, I'm not looking at that one. Right? You know, it's the same guy. But the law of God is... is given to us as like a mirror to give us an accurate reflection of who we really are and of who God is. If you, look at our, if you look to our culture to understand who you are, you will at best get a distorted picture and at worst a total lie. If you look to our culture to get an accurate reflection of who God is, you will at best get a distorted picture and at worst something totally false. We look to the word of God to understand who am I and who is he. And we need both of those things accurately. And sometimes, like if you think about it, if you look in the mirror and you see a big booger crusted inside your nose, piece of cheese on your chin from last night, total bedhead, and you walk away and go and forget all about it and walk out the day, right? Like that's the problem. Why do you look in the mirror then? To see, to do something about what you see. This is James's point. God is showing us something, not because he wants to shame us, because he loves us, he wants to transform us by the power of the word. Invite us into a different kind of life to understand who he is and who we are. In John 13, Jesus says, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that's what I am. And then later, at the end of that chapter, he says, now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you think a lot about them. No. You'll be blessed if you write them down in your journal. No, you'll be blessed if you do them, now that you know them. These things from me as your teacher and Lord. Jesus uses the same point to conclude his Sermon on the Mount. At the end of Matthew 7, this great Sermon on the Mount, he's, he's wrapping it up. And this is the image he uses, uh, Matthew 7, verses 24 to 27. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them, notice the connection, hears and does, will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain fell. And the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall, because it had been founded upon the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the, rock, on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Boy, I wonder where James got his ideas. <laughs> Maybe from his brother Jesus. Hearers and doers. The blessing is in the doing. It's not enough to be an admirer, admiring listener to sermons or to the word of Jesus. The path to life built on the rock, Christ himself, of security, of stability, of faithfulness and of blessing is in hearing and in doing the word of God. This is one of the great challenges, I think, of suburban, comfortable Christianity in America. We hear a lot of good stuff. You can get on YouTube. You can find better preachers than me. There, there's plenty of them. <laughs> I, can, I can give them to you. You can hear sermons. You can hear the Word of God. You can hear worship music. And you can fill your mind with this stuff. And it never really translates to anything in our lives. We're just going through, pursuing our own agenda. I'm speaking to myself here as well. Here's what C.S. Lewis writes about this. He, he, by the way, C.S. Lewis uh, wrote by hand, responded to every letter he ever received his entire life. I don't, I, this was before texting and email, so maybe he couldn't keep up today, but he did then. And he corresponded with a woman from America for a number of, uh, uh, almost over eight, two years. And it's collected in a book called Letters to an American Lady. She asked all kinds of questions about faith, and he responded, and it's really practical, good wisdom. Here's one of the things he says in that, in that book. Obedience is the key to all doors. Feelings come or don't come and go as God pleases. We can't produce them at will and mustn't try. This is really important, I think. I think many of us want to muster up feelings. I want to feel something. 
Can you make yourself feel something? Not really. And that's not even the most important thing. The most important thing is regardless of how you feel, be faithful, be obedient, be a doer of the word. That's actually what love is. Love is not how you feel in a given moment. Love is the decided commitment to do, to act, to serve, regardless of how it feels to you in that moment. Because feelings come and go. I tend to want to base my obedience on how I feel. Do you? I don't feel like it. It doesn't make sense to me. I'll get to that later. Let me ask you a question. What have you heard from the word of God that you've not acted on? What have you heard from God that you have not, that you've said, mm, I don't think about it. Is there a relationship in your life that is broken and you've done nothing about it? The word of God says, go, be reconciled. As far as it depends on you, live at peace with all people. Is there an issue in your life that you, you know you need to confess, you know you need help to deal with, but you're just trying to handle it on your own? Is there a part of your life that you know I am, I am selfish here and God is calling me to be generous, but I feel like if I do this, I'll lose control or lose security? What has God said to you that you've left undone? This is not a guilt trip. It's an invitation. You will be blessed if you do them. God will bless you. Look back once more at verses 22 through 25. Notice this bottom part here. He calls it the perfect law and the law of liberty. These are not two different laws. This is really the same thing as when he talks about the word of truth and the implanted word. How can, we don't think of law of, and liberty as going together, do you? Like laws are restrictive. Laws keep you in their boundaries. They're things you can't transgress or you shouldn't or you're punished. They don't, how does that produce freedom? But it, it does in the law of Christ. It does in God's economy. Because Jesus says in Matthew 5, he did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to what? Fulfill them. Not the smallest letter or the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear until everything is accomplished. And it has been accomplished. How is it accomplished? The law is fulfilled in Christ's perfect life. Perfect life of obedience. The perfect doer of the word was Jesus while on earth. And by his perfect sacrificial death on our behalf. So in his life of obedience and his death as payment for sin, he fulfills the law. Therefore, when we come to the law of God, we're not crushed with a standard we can't measure up to. It's fulfilled for us. And his fulfillment of it, his righteousness, his rightness, is given to you. So when you're in Christ, God looks at you and doesn't go, screw up, sinner, what a mess. Get that part of your life in order. He looks at you and he sees the perfect righteousness of his son given to you. That's why James can call it the law of liberty. It actually sets us free. Without him, it would crush us because we can't keep it. But with him, it's a law of liberty. It sets us free. Looking into the perfect law of God. Knowing Christ has fulfilled it for you. Receiving the implanted word of grace that sets you free and eager to hear from him and to do what he says. That's the life of blessing. I don't always live that way, but I want to. Looking into God's word and knowing this is, this is for my freedom. I see the reflection of God's perfect character and Jesus who died for me, paid for my sin and invites me then to do what he says, not because he's trying to hold me down, because he's setting me free. I want to be a doer of his word. He wants you to live the same way. In a sense, the rest of James' letter is unpacking in detail what this life of blessing is, what this path is, what it looks like. And then this little bit at the end, James gives us this little addendum here in verses 26 and 27, if we can jump there. If anyone thinks he's without, he's religious. And by the way, religious doesn't mean like, uh, we, that can be a negative term in our culture. He means the life of faith living out your faith. Without controlling his tongue, his religion is useless and he deceives himself. Pure undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. It sounds like he's like changing subjects. He's not. A friend of mine summarized this passage this way. Okay, you want to you be serious about your faith? Watch your mouth. 
take care of people, and keep your nose clean. <laughs> I think that's a pretty good summary. Real faith in Christ impacts what you say and what you don't say. And James will have a lot to say about that in chapter three when we get there. And real faith, real genuine faith, is seen best, not in your personal private devotion, but in how you care for the people who are most vulnerable in our society. Last night, the question was asked at, uh, under, at, our, at our Doubter's Guide to Jesus of John Dixon, what, what should a Christian response to immigration be? I was sitting over here, I'm going, oh, oh this ought to be good, you know. And John said something that really struck me. He said, well, there's debate to be had about border security and policies, and, and, and I'm not, you, you, same as your home, not anybody can just come in. He says, but as a Christ follower, if our first response is put up the wall and keep them out, if our first response is that, that's probably sub-Christian. Our first response ought to be compassion for people that are displaced. Now, I know some of you are like, but I think James is saying here, you want to be serious about your faith? Care about the people God cares about, the vulnerable in society, widows, orphans, those that the rest of the society looks past, doesn't see. Speaking of orphans, do you know that how, how many? Do you know how many children are in foster care in Kane County? I do. I looked it up. Four hundred and eighty. There's just over twelve hundred in, in Kane and DuPage County combined, which are the two biggest counties we draw from. Twelve hundred student children in foster care. We have a church of almost three thousand people across all of our campuses. I mean, I'm not. This is not. There's nobody at the back door trying to make you sign up. I'm just saying, like, if we're serious about our faith. Take care of children. Take care of women who are vulnerable. Take care of people who are marginalized, exploited, persecuted. Get serious about that. And this little last bit about being unstained from the world. Um, it, he's not talking about internal moral purity, although that's important. That's, the Bible talks about that. He's talking about the way we think. Are we corrupted by the opinions of the culture? Or do we see things from God's perspective? A faith that works flows from the grace of Jesus which saves us and forgives our sin and it influences every part of our life. Our speech, how we care about people, how we live and how we think. Faith that works. I want a faith that works. And by God's grace we have that in Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank and praise you for your word which we acknowledge is the perfect mirror which reflects back to us who we truly are. And sometimes we don't like what we see. But you're showing it to us for our good. And more than that, we see in your word a reflection of who you are. And you are good. And you are beautiful. And you are true. And you are right. We thank you for that, Lord. And we thank you that this word you want to plant into our souls. Forgiving our sin and setting us free and inviting us into a life of true blessing. Lord, help us by your grace and strength to be not just hearers, but doers of your word. Pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. You know, I, I meant to mention this at the uh, finish of the sermon. Perhaps some of you are here and you're thinking about this idea of uh, caring for children. There's a ministry called Safe Families, which many of our Chapel readers are a part of, and you can make a huge difference in the life of a child if you're interested uh, to find out more about Safe Families uh, to make a difference for those kids who are in foster care. We say this every week, but if you're here this morning and want someone to pray for you, you're facing some challenge, you just want to reach out to God and have someone pray alongside you, members of our prayer team are always available in the classroom at the close of the service. Now, brothers and sisters, receive the benediction. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you his peace. Amen.